Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Rochelle ferguson Biahi. Coming up on this week's show. Spurred on by the November Paris attacks, French nationals joined the Kurdish Peshmerga to fight the Islamic State group. But being accepted isn't that easy. Dubai prepares to outdo itself with plans to construct what could be the world's tallest tower. And uh, Palestinians find new ways to use space in a city where getting around can be complicated. As the battle against Islamic State group militants continues in Iraq and Syria, the number of foreign fighters who feel compelled to join the cause is growing. Well, some 20 French nationals are fighting alongside the Kurdish Peshmerga, spurred on by last November's deadly Paris attacks. Convincing the Kurds to accept them, though, isn't always easy, as Yukaroya explains. He came to the top of Montmartre to have one good look at Paris, a city still shaken by deadly terrorist attacks, and to say goodbye. The bloodshed of last November has prompted Mathieu to make a drastic decision. I thought about my children and my grandchildren and I said to myself, I don't want to see them brought to their knees by a handful of people. To protect them, Mathieu decided to leave for Iraq, to join the Kurdish Peshmerga and fight the Islamic State group. I'm going to devote myself to this cause and stay on course until the end. In the north of Iraq, at the foot of the Sinjar Mountains near the Syrian border, some other French nationals are already at the front line. Here, the Peshmerga have blocked an important road linking an Islamic State-controlled area to Mosul. 28-year-old Francois joined the fighters two months ago. Over there, the houses that have been demolished are used by Islamic State militants. There are snipers and rocket launchers hiding in those buildings. One day they take a position there, the next day they move 500 meters further away, they fire and then they run away. So it's very important to keep watch. Eleven French fighters have joined this battalion. All of them bought their own equipment. The Peshmerga have no shortage of soldiers. What they want most are weapons. This is a French vehicle. It's very efficient for protecting us, for example, from suicide bombs. But the problem is we've used up almost all our munitions. Freshly arrived from France, Mathieu goes to sign up with the Peshmerga forces. He meets a top general to explain his motivations. We've had some foreigners whose motives were not very clear, so our recruitment policy has changed. It seems the Peshmerga aren't prepared to take just anyone. Without agreement by France, we allow no one to take part in the battle, and in any case, we always run background checks. At a nearby camp, three French volunteers train Kurdish soldiers. OK, don't use your hand. They're members of the Lafayette Task Force. Named after a real army contingent that fought in Afghanistan, the group was set up by former soldiers who tried to give the same combat training as the French army. They didn't do this kind of exercise. That's why we set up this training camp. All three French veterans are under 26. The Kurds trained by them are just as young. We told them it was crazy to give up a comfortable life in France to come here, a country in war. But they said they simply wanted to help us in our battle. Back at the front line in Sinja, another French combatant, Mikael, a former Marine trooper, is starting his seventh month with the Kurds. He has already taken part in some operations and is now waiting for the launch of a major offensive to retake Mosul. He knows that one day he could come face to face with a jihadist from his own country. When we are in a battle, we don't really have time to look at the enemy's faces. But yes, it would give us extra satisfaction if we managed to bring down a French jihadist. They are scum. On social networks, many in France talk about wanting to join the Peshmerga but only around 20 or so volunteers have actually been accepted to fight on the ground. In Erbil, the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan, Mathieu still hasn't heard back from Peshmerga recruiters. He's waited 10 days and has now decided to go back to France.
To Yemen next, where a UN-brokered ceasefire has been marred by reports of sporadic violence across the country. It was hoped the truce would build trust between the Saudi-backed government and Houthi rebels ahead of peace talks set for April 18th in Kuwait. While the UN estimates that more than 6,000 people have died since the conflict escalated in March of last year. A Dubai-based developer has uh, unveiled plans to construct a new tower which will rise even higher than its own Burj Khalifa skyscraper, currently the highest building in the world. Well, it comes after Saudi Arabia announced plans to surpass its rival. Set to be completed in 2020, the skyscraper is being billed as Dubai's version of the Eiffel Tower. Finan Van Tet reports. The race to the top continues. Dubai has unveiled a plan to build a tower to rival the Burj Khalifa with a price tag of $1 billion. Designed by Spanish-Swiss architect Santiago Calatrava, the tower at Dubai Creek will have rotating balconies, indoor Babylonian gardens and a boutique hotel. We have started work on the site. At the end of June or the beginning of July, we'll start work on the foundations of the tower. And we hope that the tower will be ready before the 2020 Expo. The Expo is not the only driver. Saudi Arabia is set to complete its own vanity project, the Jeddah Tower, in 2018. Set to be the centerpiece of Kingdom City, the building will stretch just over a kilometer into the sky. At 555 meters, there will be an outdoor terrace, which will be the highest viewing platform in the world. It was designed by the same architect as Dubai's Burj Khalifa, which has become an icon of Dubai's skyline since it opened in 2010 and is currently the world's tallest building at 828 meters. The Emirate has big ambitions. The new tower is expected to rise even higher. We are keeping the height <clears throat> quiet at this stage. It'll probably be announced that when, when we open up uh, the tower, it will, will be a notch uh, probably taller than Burj Khalifa. How much taller exactly remains the crucial question. Whoever wins, the two Gulf countries will only stay on top for so long. Azerbaijan, China, Brazil, Japan and Iraq are planning to build towers that will be even taller over the next few decades. We head to Jerusalem next, a city where for Palestinians moving around freely can be complicated. Some, though, are finding innovative ways to resist. Groups of rooftop acrobats have been practicing a sport known as parkour. It's a way of a positively using space that often feels off limits. Haxi Mars Belkin brings us the story. While some heed the call to prayer, one Palestinian man takes to the rooftops of Old Jerusalem. The sport known as parkour is what happens when gymnastics meets urban adventure. A way for some of reclaiming ownership of a politicized landscape. Kutaiba is 22 years old. He discovered the sport as a child watching French films and now not a day passes without him practicing the daredevil sport. Parkour is an important part of my life. It's like it's in my blood. I can't go without it. I run and climb even in places I'm not allowed to go. It offers him a way of experiencing the old city's physical barriers as a liberating rather than restrictive force. When I'm really high, I look at everyone down below. They're so far away from me. They look tiny. I feel free, nothing's forbidden. And no one can make me come down. He's not alone in his quest for freedom. Kutaiba now gives parkour lessons to dozens of eager students. You need to push your arms in front when you jump. Then when you're coming down, you need to do the same thing. And that's how you finish. Jerusalem's Jewish and Palestinian communities have an often fraught relationship. The parkour has intrigued some. If they're doing it for fun, that's fine. But I hope that's really why they're doing it. It doesn't bother me, as long as they don't get too close. They can carry on jumping. 
When I look at all these kids who are practicing a new sport in the old city, I feel like they've accomplished something. It's better than seeing them staying at home doing nothing. So yes, I think we've created something important with these lessons. Some 100 children of all ages practice parkour in Jerusalem, and the sport is taking off in cities across the Middle East. And finally, what to do when a Dubai hotel's water park is drained for renovation? Well, a trio of professional skateboarders made the most of things, turning the temporarily dry slides into their playground. In a video released this week, skateboarders Jan Hoffman, Alex Sorgente and Milton Martinez used their dry surroundings to make imaginary waves. In a rather impressive display, they weaved through the Aquaconda water slide before taking on the almost vertical wall of the Zumarango slide. Well, that's all from the Middle East Matters team for now. See you at the same time next week.